Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Awesome. Good. All right. Um, here we go. It's uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, change my technical setup this morning, so we'll we'll see how this goes. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining this uh, briefing. I'm going to be talking about basically the uh, activities that we've been seeing for the first half of uh, 2020. Uh, and a lot of that obviously has to do with COVID and a lot of threat activity has been focused on COVID-19 uh, related research, but that's really just uh, the start of, of things really. Uh, the first half of 2020 has been a crazy ride so far. Let's see if this works. All right, great. Uh, very quickly uh, about myself here. Uh, my name is uh, Rul Schaumburg. I'm living the uh, New York City quarantine dream. Four and a half months of, you know, being cooped up in an apartment is uh, not something I recommend to anyone. Uh, on the more technical side, I've been doing cybersecurity and Intel for give or take 20 years. I've done everything from very hands-on technical work, reverse engineering, vulnerability research, campaign and actor tracking, incident response, all the way uh, to uh, building out intelligence programs. Uh, most of my time has been spent on the defensive side, and most of it has been spent on the commercial side of things. So let's uh, get into things. Um, here we kind of uh, see the, the situation as it is today, and I apologize for the uh, somewhat older uh, numbers in here. It's really, it's not about the numbers in this graph, it's more about uh, the situation in which we find ourselves. Um, now that COVID has been a thing for give or take uh, four months in, in the US and, and even longer for uh, certain countries outside of the States, right, we, we've had this a prolonged uh, pressure uh, that we can feel on an individual level, on a company level, and basically on a societal level. Um, moreover, what, what does that actually mean? Right? Now that we're, we're in, in this uh, form of quarantine, at least most of us or many of us, all right, we, we're starting to feel the uh, the psychological effects of that. Um, in addition to that, we are also starting to kind of wonder what what is you know what is going on. If you read the news, it's very hard to tell what is actually going on, right? And we we can feel that all the way up until the uh, into the government uh, level, right? We see that there is a lot of geopolitical activity, and it kind of already goes back to uh, to March, if you will. You, saw Russian leadership talk about uh, how COVID would increase the chances of cyber conflict and cyber war. And if you spend any time, you know, watching the, the Russians, uh, that's generally uh, somewhat of a sign that they're, they're, they're up to something whenever uh, Russia talks about feeling vulnerable themselves. And uh, at the same time, or around that time frame, you, you saw uh, U.S. leadership talk about how our battle readiness was not impacted in any way, shape, or form. I think in April, we saw Secretary Pompeo talk about how now, meaning uh, this time of COVID, would not be the time to uh, start conducting certain aggressive uh, cyber uh, operations. Think of uh, sabotage attacks and whatnot. I'm not sure if th those words were... Um, really listened to by some of the actors that we've seen out there, but it certainly sort of set the stage. And now that we're in the middle of July and you look at the geopolitical situation and, and look at all this cyber activity, uh, we are in very interesting uh, times indeed. Right? When we look that on the uh, cyber uh, side, apologies, normally I have the uh, animations turned off. Um, no. Uh, on the cyber side, we see that opportunism is on the rise. And that manifests itself in many different ways. When we look at this quote here on the upper left-hand side, um, we, we, we see that you know big uptick in, uh, in reports uh, that the FBI is receiving. I think that's uh, partly an accurate reflection of reality. I think also uh, part of that is now that we are all so aware of the the, the COVID threat or the, the COVID uh, social engineering threat, if you will, um, we, we are very aware of it and we are watching it more closely than we would be watching other 
uh, types of social engineering uh, opportunities. Right? So we, we see that increased activity on the one hand, and we have increased, increased awareness on the other hand. So, so that that certainly, um, you know, so, somewhat skew, skews those numbers on on both ends. But um, when we think about COVID, right, there, we, there's no getting uh, around the uh, unemployment that we see across the world and people sitting at home across the world. And for the last 20 years or so, uh, I have seen what, whenever there, there's there's a summer break or a spring break or whatever it may be, you, we, I saw an uptick in the amount of uh, malware that was being produced. And now with so many people working from home all the time or taking class from home, uh, that has become the new normal, or at least the temporary new normal. Um, and when we look at the cybercrime ecosystem more specifically, what we see is that all these different actors, or a lot of them, are starting to specialize in a specific task. And I should add here that at CrowdStrike, we call a specific uh, or presumed e-crime or cybercrime actor uh, a spider. Right? So it, as you can see on the slide, we, the slide touches on a couple different spiders. Those are all considered uh, cybercrime teams. So these different cybercrime teams, they're starting to uh, get more specialized. There is an actor we track as Mummy Spider, responsible for the Emotet botnet. And Emotet really is sort of the Akamai of malware delivery, if you will. But Mummy Spider really just does initial intrusion. Right? You may have seen or you have likely seen uh, their spam emails. Right? They also like um, uh, injecting themselves into already existing email threads. Right? So that's sort of you know touching uh, an environment, but that's specifically for the purpose of getting into uh, the next environment, if you will. Really, that their tasking is all around the initial intrusion. Then they sell off that access to some of the other teams uh, that they work with. Right? So, so that's uh, certainly uh, a lot more professional than what, what we saw uh, five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. And so it's that, that tasking really makes things a lot more interesting. Uh, moreover, when you think about very specific tasking, that's effectively mimicking the way some of the nation state teams uh, operate. And I think moving forward, what we're increasingly going to see is that continued uh, evolution on the e-crime side, where the e-crime actors are going to be able to uh, maintain a high operations tempo and get closer and closer to how the, the nation state actors uh, operate. Uh, for sure, right? We, we can't ignore the fact that nation state teams have access to zero-day vulnerabilities or zero-day exploits and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, operations tempo is uh, arguably more more important, right? If we assume that some of these cybercrime teams have time, right, to get into a, a specific organization, that that kind of negates the necessary use of that zero-day exploit. Um, moreover, I should add here that uh, uh, what we're seeing a lot of, especially since 2018, uh, is what we are calling big game hunting which is that the concept of um, targeted ransomware attacks against an organization. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the actor has an active interest in that or in this or that specific organization, but targeting organizations rather than individual machines. And then that allows the ransomware actor to ask for a much higher ransom demand. If you think back to, uh, let's say, CryptoLocker back in 2013, that was a, a $600 ransom per box, right? That, 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 that's, that's money, right? But if the, the, the attacker is able to ask for uh, 100K or, or more targeting an entire organization, that's really a much better return of investment for them. And kind of leading into that, right? Um, since uh, that, that 2018 uh, timeframe that I mentioned, uh, we, we're seeing that that shift where more and more of these ransomware teams are targeting organizations and that targeting uh, really is very much hands on keyboard. I mentioned uh, Emotet by Mummy Spider just now. Um, let's say let's take Wizard Spider here. 
uh, is kind of the king of the hill. Wizard Spider is responsible for uh, malware uh, tools such as uh, the uh, Ryuk ransomware, Anchor DNS, and TrickBot, which you likely have heard of as well. So let's say Wizard Spider uh, buys access into an organization from Mummy Spider. It will generally first deploy the TrickBot malware. TrickBot is technically a piece of banking malware, but a better way of looking at it uh, is really it's a piece of nation state grade modular malware where the, the operators can push particular modules into the environment as they see fit. Then uh, on the TrickBot side, there's tasking that relates to network reconnaissance, figuring out where the interesting intellectual property is, PII, uh, backups, uh, domain controllers, you name it. Then there's a handoff to a second person or team that actually may do some of that data exfiltration. Uh, maybe they have a specific interest in the intellectual property of that particular target organization, it uh, depends. And after that part is completed, there is a handoff to another person or team, along with the, with the notes from, from the prior uh, people that uh, tell, you know, that, that, that sorry, that the handoff is to a person or team that's responsible for deploying the Ryu ransomware into that target organization. Right, so that's again very specific tasking, even within a particular uh, group or loose group within a threat actor. And again, that that's really reminiscent of um, how most state actor teams work, and it also fundamentally changes the dynamics of defense. And this inherently means you you are fighting against a team of people, which is very different from fighting let's say a, a WannaCry, right? To name one very uh, well-known example. WannaCry was a worm, so if you, you knew how to counter the abilities of the worm, you, you were set. Uh, countering the abilities of a, a set of people is an entirely different endeavor, right? So in 2020, uh, hands-on keyboard uh, operations are becoming the norm, and when we specifically look at the activity we see in North America, we see um, statistically, we see a lot more of that hands-on keyboard activity in the U.S. than in the rest of the world. So, I, personally, I think that's partly because uh, we are the tip of the spear as far as it comes to uh, EDR and threat hunting and whatnot, and that really requires uh, hands-on keyboard activity from the actor side, from, from the threat actor side, to uh, be more effective. So we're really moving into the, the next stage of the game, if you will. Uh, in addition to all of that, and if the situation isn't already uh, interesting enough, since basically the end of last year, we've seen a major shift in how uh, these uh, ransomware campaigns play out. Rather than just encrypting all the data in an environment and asking for a ransom, the, uh, a lot of these teams are now also exfiltrating uh, data and holding that data um, uh, hostage or for ransom, whatever you want to call it, and basically threatening publication if the target organization doesn't pay up. Right? We, we see a number of these threat actors that have their own forums or blogs, or you name it, where they just push uh, the stolen information. And for some of these target organizations, we're literally talking terabytes and terabytes of, uh, of data that's being pushed. Uh, a subset of these actors also likes the, uh, the concept of uh, um, auctioning off this information instead of just publishing it, right? They quote unquote, re recoup some of their uh, investments as, as they like to call it. And, and on the screen, you can, you can see this timeline. When we take a step back here, um, there, there, there's a couple of things that are really very important to consider. We've already seen that ransomware has been used as a cover for action for sabotage campaigns. Think back to, uh, well, WannaCry, for instance. WannaCry what was sabotage uh, masked as a ransom. Same for uh, the NotPetya attack that targeted Ukraine and uh, companies doing business in Ukraine. That was very clearly... Um, a sabotage attack that was masking as ransomware, uh, clearer than, uh, let's say, a WannaCry and some other examples. 
now that there's that data exfiltration component to uh, ransomware, it also becomes the perfect cover for action for espionage. I, I saw an example recently of a company that got hit by by this. I had, was effectively a defense contractor. They, they had more than a terabyte of their data stolen. I think the chances of a defense contractor paying up any type of ransom is a very close to zero, right? And, and again, given the type of sensitive information that was stolen, you really have to ask yourself, what's going on here? And this gets more interesting even when you consider that a lot of these ransomware teams are using uh, affiliate models to um, conduct their operation. And that affiliate model means that uh, even if we, we know who the developers of the ransomware are, we don't necessarily know who's operating the ransomware. Right? That, that could be somebody in, uh, let's say, Germany who is unemployed because of COVID. That could also be a foreign intelligence team. There's no easy way to tell. Right? And I'll be touching on, on some of the nation state activity that we've been seeing the first half of this year. Um, for the nation state, it's becoming interesting to potentially run some of their ops through uh, this, this ransomware cover, because that's a whole lot harder to investigate. When, when, when you are in your uh, environment and you realize, oh, this piece of malware belongs to Fancy Bear, Russian intelligence, you know you have a real problem. If you run into, let's say, uh, Maze or our evil, two uh, versions of the uh, two families of ransomware, you know you have a problem, but you don't necessarily know how big of a problem you have exactly. Right. So, so that's really going to be very interesting to watch uh, moving forward. On the slide here, you can see um, basically we, we we mapped out all the different um, industries that these ransomware uh, groups are targeting for with data disclosures. So we can see that there's a number of industries that are, are very, very popular with these groups, primarily manufacturing, industrial, technology, and financials, right? And, and that is very, very interesting. Uh, when, when I see some of the, the targets, either in, in manufacturing or in financials, um, especially when we consider that some of the targets were um, um, energy companies, meaning um, utilities, not, not, like, not oil and gas per se. Uh, the idea of e-crime actors going after utilities specifically prior to 2020 was kind of outlandish. There, there was some precedent for it, but going after utilities with ransomware operations, I think that would have being considered a little bit too risky. Now in this, uh, I'll call it this time of COVID, suddenly that's acceptable, um, which, well, I, I guess I wouldn't say it's acceptable, it's, it's being done, right? And, and that's a really a fundamental pivot. So, so that's really something to keep in mind here. Things are getting more aggressive and, and companies or sectors that previously figured that they would be off limits to anyone except for uh, state actor teams with, with well, uh, state backing, uh, you kind of have to reconsider that notion. So ne next to that activity, which uh, again, really has uh, ramped up uh, considerably over uh, the first half of, uh, of 2020, you've seen an exponential rise in the in e-crime activity. And a lot of that e-crime ecosystem is really revolving around uh, ransomware with uh, these criminal actors directly or in indirectly supporting these hands-on keyboard ransomware operations. When we uh, look at uh, COVID-themed attacks for over the first half of 2020, we can basically divide those up into four uh, distinct silos. The first one is a web distribution, uh, which involves a uh, strategic web compromise for, of websites ranging from health websites all the way to uh, WordPress uh, sites, which aren't nearly as exciting, I'd say. Um, but as we, we keep in mind, right, every, uh, every local entity has COVID-related websites, right? It's in the state and local level, 
um, maybe even per neighborhood, I, I've seen uh, COVID-related websites, and that's something uh, that's a clear target for uh, some of these actors, as these websites aren't necessarily uh, built with rigidity in mind. In many cases, they were just put up very quickly. And that, that second uh, silo, uh, it's still active, uh, especially on the fishing side. Um, and that those fishing themes have kind of evolved over time. So I'll say that um, impersonating the WHO and the, the CDC are still very, very popular. I'd say that's kind of the, the constant trend. That's been the, the one big constant over the last couple months. Other than that has kind of evolved as uh, some of the narratives in the news have evolved. Uh, vishing, which is a phishing via uh, phone calls, is something that we saw a lot of in the uh, March, April time frame, but has kind of diminished at this point. Uh, same goes for a smishing, which is uh, phishing via a text message. Being in New York, uh, there was at one point in the March, April time frame, I was getting, I, it felt like I was getting 20 text messages from the city a day telling me what to do, uh, what websites to go to, to, to read up on, on COVID. That really made it very easy for adversaries to kind of latch on to. Now that, that activity, at least for the time being, is a little slower, depending on where you are. Uh, the, that, that has kind of uh, you know, taken a, a backseat. But as that COVID situation evolves, right, that, that might change again. So, so that's really something to, to keep in mind. Not, none of these uh, things on the social engineering side are going to be static, right? They're, they're going to latch on to uh, latest developments and kind of work it like that. So depending on, well, regardless of, of what decision is made with regards to the uh, uh, unemployment insurance and that uh, July 31st timeline, right, that makes a, a, a great uh, lure for, for the adversary. The uh, third silo is um, anything that has to do with uh, remote work. We've seen a huge uptick in RDP exposed to the internet and new uh, VPN servers exposed to the internet, which is really uh, two mechanisms that uh, various threat actors, including a lot of the ransomware uh, teams, love using to get a foothold inside an environment. Um, and I'd say that uh, we should also include in this uh, particular silo um, phishing emails that kind of target that shift in business practice, right? So think of an example like, uh, hey, Jill, this is Bill from IT. You need to install this patch because we were updating the VPN server. That's not explicitly COVID-19 related, but that's targeting that shift in business process. And that's really something to keep in mind as well, right? Anytime there's that major shift in business process, that might be observable over the internet through a tool like Shodan or something else. That is something that adversaries actively track and they can craft their phishing emails or their phishing LinkedIn messages or you, you name it uh, around those developments. The fourth uh, silo or area is information operations um, or psyops, disinformation, fake news, whatever you want to call it. We've seen an explosion of that. Some of that centers around 5G and COVID, which I don't want to touch right now, uh, but on, on the more macro level, right, we, we've seen that a lot of that used in a state-on-state -state action. We've seen uh, China leverage information operations to make the U.S. look bad, right? They, they put out that narrative that it was um, uh, U.S. Special Forces that took the COVID virus from Fort Detrick and uh, introduced it in Wuhan, which is, which is uh, to many people at first, right? Uh, certainly over the last five years or so, the, the predominant narrative has been that the Russians like targeting uh, the U.S. and make the, look, the U.S. look bad, while China primarily uses their information operations to make themselves look good. I think COVID is really exposing the fact that that is not an accurate observation. I'll leave it at that, right? It's been, become very clear that they're very comfortable in being highly ag aggressive.
So um, kind of uh, pivoting back here and, and looking at uh, some of these, uh, the, the threats that we've seen um, really leverage that COVID-19 theme. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, it's more ransomware. Again, on the e-crime side, as I mentioned before, there is really uh, a conversions on, on anything ransomware. And again, that combination of the, uh, the sabotage and the, the data exfiltration really makes it a, a one-size-fits-all kind of solution for a lot of the threat actors out there. Um, what you also see here on this slide, right, there was an announcement saying, hey, we won't target hospitals or we won't target healthcare, and that was um, cleanly ignored, which uh, shouldn't really surprise anyone, right? So we, we've seen that that overall uptick on that e-crime activity, and some of that is COVID-19 themed, and some of this just using that COVID-19 uh, confusion and, and pressure. Uh, very quick. Quickly here, I kind of touched on this already, right? When we look at things from the social engineering and phishing side, um, the CDC and WHO are basically the top two uh, spoofed uh, senders that, that we, we have observed. And uh, as the, the situation evolves on the COVID side, we, we see those uh, messages change as well. Uh, some of the phishing messages that we've uncovered uh, have been very different as they related to uh, COVID, it may have been along the lines of, uh, hey, this is your boss because of uh, the COVID-19 situation. We unfortunately have to uh, let you go. Please click here to complete your exit. Um, yeah, that's that's very, very nasty but and effective. Um, kind of continuing on here, just the, the different, um, uh, spoof sources that we see and again th this really touches on everyone right pretty much everybody in the country or even outside the country has uh, some form of active interest in COVID-19 it makes it the uh, the great equalizer right we've even seen some examples of uh, leveraging that COVID-19 theme uh, with uh, people in the uh, working for the federal government let me leave it at that Right. I think as the, the lure was along the lines of uh, get, getting them free pizza or something like that. Uh, again, whatever works for the attackers. Kind of um, looking forward here on the e-crime uh, side, um, I don't see anything uh, uh, mo uh, become very, very different at this point in time. We were kind of in a, a sort of status quo with the status quo being as the COVID-19 situation changes, the e-crime actors will adapt to it. They will adapt their, their messaging. Um, as I, as I uh, mentioned, I've, I've been living that quarantine dream for give or take four and a half months. I like to think that that's a, a temporary normal, but when talking about the, the ransomware, big game hunting with lots of hands on keyboard activity, that is the permanent new normal. And that's going to uh, present a lot of challenges. And, and I think we'll be reading a lot about these uh, activities in the news, right? The, these ransomware events tend to be uh, fairly public if it's a, it's a well-known company. So moving on to uh, nation-state activity, I think we, we've all seen the uh, various press releases uh, in recent weeks from uh, DOJ and uh, friends relating to uh, attacks observed uh, by Chinese actors, attacks observed by uh, Russian actors. Um, and then uh, that's something that we've uh, certainly observed as well. But so far, uh, most of that messaging that we've seen in the public domain has been uh, revolving around companies that are actively involved in vaccine research or clinical trials, you name it. The, the the actual scope, the actual breadth of the state actor attacks as it relates to COVID-19 is much wider and much deeper. Uh, it's safe to say that any company vaguely associated with the COVID-19 response process is an active target of, at minimum, China and, and, and Russia, and to a lesser extent, Iran and North Korea. 
right? So that doesn't stop at vaccines and serums and trials and whatnot. That goes way beyond that, goes into any company that's in manufacturing, creating masks or creating PPE, valid target. Doesn't really stop there. If you're a, a company through which um, the, the economy can be measured, right? Or, or rather certain types of activity can be measured. Think uh, potentially even farming. Think, well, the, 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 sky is, the sky is the limit. There's many different ways to infer economic trends without looking at just, you know, the stock market. Um, so any company that can give some additional guidance to China, to Russia, with regards to how we are actually doing as a, as a country, that is an active target. Right? When we talk about um, not necessarily trusting the numbers that are being produced either by Russia or the, the Communist Party in China, right? the Communist Party in China doesn't trust our numbers either. So they are looking for intelligence gathering opportunities to see if they can confirm our numbers. Right? And then our numbers are, um, you know that that could be the, the the numbers with regards to the economy, with regards to employment, um, hospitalization, you name it, right? And uh, as I as I said, uh, there's there's many different ways of inferring what's actually going on in country, right? With, with so many different narratives hitting the news, right? It becomes very very challenging to determine what is actually happening. Right, and that's a challenge for you and I. That's also a challenge for intelligence agencies. So they have to come up with new mechanisms to uh, try and distill what's actually happening. So let, let's first have a, a a look here at China, which again has been very very aggressive uh, across the board. What we need to keep in mind here is that for intelligence agencies, uh, COVID is an opportunity. Right. Again, I mentioned earlier uh, during this briefing that you know, we, we start feeling that stress and that strain of that continued uh, quarantine or that you know that continued anxiety, and, and that means it's it's getting easier for all of us to to make mistakes, right? And and certainly when I make the mistake of going on social media, right, the the language we see used on social media has become very, very hard, right? There, there's very little compassion. And that, that's certainly partly because of that COVID situation that we're in. Anyhow, that, that's not necessarily very cyber, but it's certainly something that the uh, offensive cyber teams love exploiting, right? We become more susceptible to social engineering. So looking at these uh, three different uh, actors here, I should add that at CrowdStrike, anything that uh, we think is uh, affiliated or sponsored by the uh, Chinese Communist Party or, uh, you know, originating out of China, we, we call those actors uh, pandas. And, and for, for those more technically inclined on the, uh, on the call, right, we see Bizinal, we see uh, Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy is almost old enough to drink, right? It was... Uh, it was a rat developed by uh, somebody out in Sweden, give or take 20 years ago, right? So see that, see those tools used by uh, state actors is something that that person most certainly did not envision 20 years ago, right? And it's really all there to make that uh, matter of attribution a little bit more complicated because you're thinking, oh, this is, you know, commodity malware. Um, this is no big deal, but this is actually what some of these uh, state teams love using. Uh, in addition to that, um, part, uh, the, the pirates have been around for, for well over a decade at this point. They know poison ivy inside and out. Right? There is an advantage to that. They, they, they know all the intricacies and they know how to work, uh, work around um, whatever issues they, they may be facing. And the same thing goes uh, for the, the Bisnal malware. Should also add here that the uh, destroy uh, rat leveraged by Mustang is also known as Plugix. Right? Plugix is used by uh, a ton of different uh, Chinese uh, APTs. Right? So that that too confuses the the attribution part. Right? Even if we we have uh, 
we reasonably know, oh, this piece of malware is only used by state teams out of this or that country, that still doesn't really provide the full attribution to a particular team. And you always want that attribution to a particular team so you have a much better understanding of motive, intent, and capability. Some of these teams are in strictly engaged in espionage, which is problematic, obviously, but uh, is somewhat constrained, let's put it that way. Then we see other teams that are comfortable also uh, deploying ransomware or, or sabotage uh, mechanisms. That, that's a whole different ball game. Right? So that's really uh, something to consider here. And so uh, COVID or the COVID crisis has really been a, a way for different state actor teams as well as e-crime teams to differentiate themselves right are they able to kind of uh, rise to the challenge or to rise to the opportunity that's being presented by covid where on the one hand there's there's new intelligence targets that need to be hit for getting that information or more high priority intelligence targets i should say well at the other well at the same time trying to hit more targets uh, because they're just more susceptible at this point in time. So that's really uh, something to keep in mind. Also be aware, right, COVID isn't peacetime. We are at something in between peacetime and in conflict time. When, when we think back to, the, or, or even look at the, the conversations that are happening in the European Union right now, right, it's, it's really, to some extent, it's still each country fighting their own fight, right? So even though I'm kind of talking about China and, and Russia uh, for the most part at this point, it's really each country uh, fighting uh, for their own, right? Even in a place like the European Union, there, 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 there's some form of struggle between countries getting resources, getting, uh, getting funds, getting other types of resources. I'll leave it at that. So that's really something to, to consider. We, we are not at peacetime. And I wanted to uh, take a, a minute or two here specifically to call out Wicked Panda, also known as uh, the Winty Group. Um, these guys, or this team, I should say, really stepped it up. You can see on the slide here, uh, technically very, very adapt. But one, one thing that really stood out to me is uh, some of the suspected operations they were performing in May in Taiwan, where we, we saw um, this information. Uh, being pushed right around the same time that there was uh, ongoing espionage activity by Winti, as well as um, actually ransomware that was uh, pushed by Winti into 10 technology and energy or utility companies. Right? That's a very, very clear escalation, and it's a very, very clear development, right? That this is that these types of multi domain operations have historically only been associated with. Uh, the, the Russian actors, right? Specifically, when we think uh, back to some of the 2016 activity, some of the activity we've seen in Ukraine. So, seeing uh, Wicked Panda make that leap is certainly something to re be really, really aware of, right? And that that was back in May, which feels like two years ago. Looking at the current geopolitical situation with China, right? This is this is a space that really needs uh, watching continuously, right? It, this, this is consistently escalating. And if we're seeing ransomware deployed in tech and, and, and utilities in Taiwan, uh, that could be a precursor to seeing that activity in other places, very similarly to where some of the Russian activity was first observed in Ukraine before it was observed in other countries. And uh, briefly uh, touching on uh, Russia here, and I appreciate that I'm, I'm running uh, somewhat low on time. Um, we've seen uh, Russia really uh, step it up as well, which shouldn't really come as a surprise to anyone. There's certainly a lot more APT teams in China, but for the most part, right, the 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 work produced by uh, the Russian APT teams is uh, still the class, you know. The, uh, still the best out there, so to say. So what we saw around that March timeframe is 
a, a number of these uh, teams started deploying entirely new malware that hadn't been seen before, as well as targeting entirely new verticals that we also had not seen them target before, right? And that kind of goes back to the, uh, the ability of intelligence agencies, uh, you know, how th that question of uh, being nimble. How, you know, for, for a lot of intelligence agencies, that there's a fair amount of bureaucracy in how they can do their stuff. But we, we saw, uh, you know, the bears pivot um, quite well. So seeing them pu push that new malware, that's, I, I'm speculating here, it was probably done because during that March timeframe, a lot of companies were transitioning to working from home. Their visibility went down, right? A lot of uh, companies out there didn't have, and some of them still don't have, the, the necessary orchestration to have the, the same um, visibility uh, that uh, they have when everybody's working in the office, right? Which, in my, in my, uh, from my point of view, that that's uh, a failure of technology. Uh, you know, uh, forward-looking technology does not care if uh, you know the workforce is working in the office or working from home. So deploying that malware right at, at that time was. Uh, very opportunistic on their side and we, we're still able to catch it but uh, i can only assume that some other security companies may have had a, a harder time doing that and, and also targeting those new verticals that weren't necessarily pharmacy related or bi uh, biotech biomedical related um, again shows them being aware of the type of opportunity that was being uh, presented to them and in the offline world, right? I think in back in April there was a, an announcement that um, some um, some operatives uh, connected to a fancy bear were arrested in in the Czech Republic uh, in, in, in a connection to um, assassination attempts against three different mayors in the Czech Republic. And again, leveraging. That, that chaos at the time. And, and again, that's not cyber, but that's what these, these teams are able to do, right? They are able to work across different domains and that's why they, you, uh, your threat intelligence needs to be aware of that work in these different domains as well, right? So looking forward, uh, looking ahead to what we're gonna see in terms of targeted intrusion, uh, COVID-19 is going to remain a lure for social engineering, while at the same time, any company vaguely associated with the COVID-19 response process is going to be an active target. And um, depending on how we do in terms of quarantines and, and whatnot, right, those psychological uh, effects aren't going to go away all right and that's what state actors are going to try and exploit as well so uh lo looking ahead there, there's really nothing but interesting times ahead um which really means that we we need to uh step up our uh, defenses more more than ever i need to be aware of the fact that hey we are uh vulnerable in, in these different categories and this is where we need to uh, spend some additional resources just to create that internal awareness. As I said, I'm very, uh, I intellectually appreciate that four and a half months of quarantine has a psychological effect on me. It doesn't really, you know, th saying that doesn't negate that impact. So that's really something that we need to think about because it, it is going to be increasingly more likely that employees are going to slip up. And right? so, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that? Um, your employees are more likely to fall for that social engineering trap. Um, with that, I, uh, I have one more slide. I think I'm going to be uh, right on time. So, right, when we, we think about these uh, more uh, sophisticated attacks, right, there, there's basically four different uh, areas to really think about. First is your, your technical intelligence, right? Having indicators of compromise or activity that tell you which um, threat actor is associated with that malware, right? Having very easy form of attribution so you can determine motive and intent with ease. 
That second area is really around intelligence reporting, having both technical intelligence that you can operationalize for your um, internal organization, for your threat hunting, for your IR, for your other engagements, as well as having more uh, strategic and political intelligence reporting that allows you to make good business decisions. Right? Threat, threat intelligence should also very much focus on the geopolitical uh, situation because things are getting increasingly spicy and making good business decisions down the road is going to be impossible without that type of uh, Finnish intelligence reporting at hand. The third area that you want to consider is uh, threat hunting, right? With the, the notion that more and more of these activities that we're seeing are hands on keyboard, the only way to act, you know, really effectively stop those is by actively threat hunting for those in your environment, right? We are uh, really entering a new phase of the, uh, the endpoint security uh, game and, and threat hunting is, uh, is no longer a nice to have, it's, it's a must have. And if you're, you do not have the necessary instrumentation to facilitate that, you might want to uh, really think hard. And then that fourth area to really think about is having that capability, having the ability to reach out to somebody when you don't have the capability and you need some additional help on red teaming, IR, to building out either your hunting program or your in Intel program. And uh, with that, I want to wrap it up. Uh, there should have been a slide that said questions, but I guess I conveniently cut that off. My apologies. Do we have any questions? Great. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you for attending and thank you for presenting, Raoul. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Take care. Well, it sounds about the same, actually. Maybe.